So I, I have to admit, there will be absolutely no dancing during this presentation. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint. Um, yeah, I. In in fact, this this entire presentation is going to be entirely different from everything we've done so far. No mo molecules will be harmed in the articulation of my presentation. Um, this isn't going to be an awesome celebration of spacecraft. Um, it's, it's instead going to take a look at how we can engage your communities. Now, in, in putting this together, I could have put together your standard, here are the top 10 ways you can increase your search engine optimization and increase your audience numbers and audience interactivity. But you guys are smart, and you can go read those things on BuzzFeed. Um, instead, what, what I'm going to work to do is introduce you to ways to think about how you communicate science that changes the story so that instead of just listing out facts and figures and molecules, what you're doing is introducing people who don't live science the way we do to what it's like to be in the story so that they can see the human side of the facts, the figures, the fiascos that, that we create. So some of you in this room are, are graduate students who are here trying to learn how to communicate science while at home you're working to, well, advance our understanding of the universe. And it's awesome to see all of you proto-academics here. And some of you are professional writers. You're in the old media. and you're here learning how to better tell this particular story. Some of us who are here are here because, well, we're the people that are trying to do the science, communicate the science, we're managing the budgets, and we're going on one hand from being interviewed to interviewing others as we try and get the story out. It's complicated. But we are all in this room, in our diverse ways, science communicators. One of the things that I did yesterday was, instead of going up and doing a tour of, of the space science labs with you, I grabbed all of your Twitter handles. Well, actually, Laura and Tom grabbed all of your Twitter handles, and I ruthlessly stole the data. <laughs> and I pulled all of our connections. The people in this room, as of lunch yesterday, had 92,417 Twitter followers alone. Many of us have far more people following us on other social media platforms. The remarkable thing about this is every person in this room is connected by at least one audience member. But the majority of our audience members aren't overlapping. The diversity of our voices are reaching in to a diversity of communities so that when we each tell our stories and share each other's comments, we are able to reach more people together than any one of us can do individually. Um, it's also cool to just see the strengths of the connections in the different ways where those of us that take the time to retweet and share each other's stuff end up growing audiences that are more and more interlinked. It really is a community where people are listening in on our conversations. Now looking at all of this, I feel like I can say, you're good, you've got this. But there are still things left that, that we can learn. And this is where I want to challenge all of you to look at how you communicate science and, and try and do it the harder way that requires you to think strategically about what is not just the fact, the figure, the who did it, the standard, just the facts, ma'am, but what can you do to change the way people think about science? And this is where I got to the title, and I'm probably the first person to have my title slide be like slide 10. But the title of this talk was Doing Science Out Loud. And some of the people in this room are actively doing science out loud. 
Others are live tweeting conferences, are embedding with the New Horizons mission, are finding ways to take the entire story, which is really a new formulation of the inquiry cycle, and take this cycle that goes from questions to funding to construction to data acquisition to analysis to publication to, oh crap, what does this mean? We have new questions. They're looking to take this cycle and make this what we're communicating through our media. So what does this mean in the social media context? So I'm going to start with, with the idea of, of questions. And this is where we start having to ask, why is it worth funding science? What are the fundamental questions that, that change what we think about that your average person who is worried about drought conditions, who is worried about the price of gasoline, why should they care about what's going on in orbit? And this is where we can go from talking about well, we are going to do this very specific thing to saying there's this decadal survey process. There's this way that we look to find out what are the big questions that are going to change our understanding of everything. And you can articulate why these questions matter. Um, this is the difference between saying MAVEN is going to Mars to measure how the atmosphere is being lost. Okay your average person does not care. To instead saying, the MAVEN mission is going to Mars. It is measuring how the atmosphere is being lost. And we can take that data and work it backwards to figure out if Mars once supported life. Now suddenly people care about that. It's changing the format of the question to make it a story instead of just a fact. To give the why does this matter? This is how you can start tying it to the articles that are out there which your editor cares about. This is how you increase your click rate. If you just say, Maven is going to Mars to study the atmosphere, I wouldn't even care about that. I'm not an atmospheres person. But if suddenly it becomes, this is part of how we understand, was it habitable? Was there rainfall? Was it an icy past, a watery past, and can we understand whether the water came from asteroids or comets by looking at the chemicals. Now MAVEN can't do all of that, but you can start to tie in the story of the questions and why the questions matter. And since social media is a dialogue, when someone sends you your question, their question about what's going on, you can forward that out, you can share it, you can answer it out loud, and you can make the big question the mission is studying relate to the little questions that your audience is answering and turn it into a community dialogue about how we're discovering our solar system in this case. Now, it, one of the things that we also unfortunately end up addressing, and we're actually pretty good about doing this, is, is funding. This is where you get the stories of the Congress giveth and the Congress taketh away. And, and we have to remember when we're writing these stories, when we're tweeting out the anger at today's voting and call your representative and here are the phone numbers, um, the public don't understand what slides like this mean. So, so I have seen this exact slide go out on Twitter, go out on Facebook, and... <laughs> What the hell is cross-agency support for agency management and operations as compared to center management and operations? And, and where does the inspect... It, it's... You have to give these things context. And a lot of people completely forget that space is a human story. A few weeks ago, NASA announced by press conference, which may be the worst possible thing you can do to a human being, um, what instruments were getting funded for the planned Europa mission. The PIs got the phone call whether or not they were funded, but were instructed not to tell their team members, which means the team members are dialed in 
tuned in, watching the NASA press conference to find out if they have funding for their careers to continue for the next however many years. Can you imagine knowing that whether or not you have a job tomorrow is getting announced in a press conference? Now, Sarah Horst, who goes by Planet Doctor on Twitter, her instrument was one of the ones, and she wasn't PI, so she didn't know, was one of the ones getting announced. And so she starts the day. Today is Europa Day. At 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, NASA announces instrument selections for Europa. It will be a very good and or bad day for me and Planet Friends. And she live discusses the entire thing. There were 30, I double included that. This is not my tech day. There were 33, 33 instruments proposed. She went on in what I failed to copy in correctly to discuss um, what the different instruments were. The mass spec proposal I was on was not selected. But she keeps going, quoting out Niebuhr, we had 33 proposals, nine selected, a magnetometer, Faraday cups, IR spectrometer, by the way, I'm te tweeting through tears right now because I've been crying off and on for a few hours since I heard the news. Imagine not just writing the, these are the instruments selected story, but the, this is how many jobs that were created. This is what it means to be selected. And if you want to learn more, Go check out this story of someone who wasn't selected. This is powerful. This communicates the other side of science that people don't think about, the human story. All through Twitter. Now, one of the things that we do a lot is we look for the analogy. This is one that I had ended up using in fundraising quite, select, quite successfully. Now, a lot of people, you have to know your audience. People will put out, hey, the NASA budget is the same as this many days of the Iraqi war, to which people may respond if you have the wrong audience, but we have a mandate to protect whatever they think the justification for war is, and going to the moon and Mars is not a mandate. You, you end up with those angry things. You have to know your audience. When you make the analogy of, PepsiCo made more profit last year than NASA's entire budget, which is true. PepsiCo you could have used their entire budget to fund all of NASA. Other people will say, but NASA is just a social handout and Pepsi did the capitalist thing to earn that money. Know your audience. We figured out that if we compared that there were 55K raised on Kickstarter to fund potato salad, Maybe we'd get people to donate to CosmoQuest because, hey, we're doing science and isn't that cooler than potato salad? <laughs> and since we were reaching out to a crowdfunding organization, this analogy worked. So you need to have the analogies. You need to have the context. But you have to make sure that the one you're using works. I know for most of my audience, the analogy I can use and use most often is, McDonald's typically spends more advertising happy meals to children. So this is strictly advertising money for junk food for small children than NASA has to fund EPO to educate kids and adults and everyone else about all of NASA's science. How depressing is that? And that's an analogy that works because my audience I know cares about education and social justice, which includes junk food, somehow. <laughs> you also need to be able to communicate units and duration and time in a way that matters. This is one where MasterCard, not quite style. Hubble Space Telescope, total cost 2.5 billion, mission length 9,150 days. That's $270,000 per day. Dreams fulfilled, uncountable. And the human story. That's me in 1990 at Space Camp where we pretended to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope. 
And this is me today where I got an award letter a month ago to work with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the human story of how people follow their dreams to go from the kids dreaming of the space race to being engaged in the space race. And this is where you can take the twist to now talk about the science that wasn't imagined in 1990. Tell the facts, tell the figures, give it a context. $270,000 a day is so much different than $2.5 billion, especially when you start thinking about like what American Airlines spends on aircraft maintenance. There's so many things that you can do to just change the perspective. Now, the other thing that we end up covering, and NASA really helps with this because they like to take us places, is the construction of things. So there's the flying humans on Sophia, the taking humans to ribbon cuttings, the all of these things. Um, were any of you able to go to the Alma first light that they took a bunch of journalists to? You are planet folks, okay. <laughs> so. I was a human on Sophia, does that count? Yes, that counts, okay. <coughs> so, so telling the story of construction of these things, this is another place where we lose the story in talking about this many million dollars, billion dollars spent to build this many meters of collection area. And astronomy has a very special story it can tell here that changes the perspective of all of those people who are like, but we should feed the children. It was articulated to me by one of the South Africans that was working on the Square Kilometer Array program. He said, people argue that we should not be spending money on astronomy here in South Africa because we have people who are starving. He was far more articulate than me, I'm paraphrasing. In South Africa, their yearly budget for all of astronomy and space science is enough to feed the entire country one meal. And then they go back to starving. But when you build the SALT telescope and Sutherland Observatory, when you build SKA, when you build all of these facilities, you are taking internet, infrastructure, high-tech jobs, and things like fresh water that we don't think about into regions that never had it. There have been revolutions in Chile, in South Africa, in all of these places. We don't think about it, but even the Canary Islands didn't have that many high-tech jobs before we put the telescopes there. We are bringing new forms of infrastructure as we build our observatories. And in many cases, the people welcome and embrace this technology because we're also bringing the money we spend. We are bringing, I mean, think about it. You bring your wife, your husband, your kids with you. When you move to one of these countries, you're now spending money. In the news, we often hear about Google opening a new office. This will bring this many jobs. This will bring this much income to a city. We talk about the Super Bowl being an economic benefit to whatever city it's in any given year. When do we ever talk about the local economic boon that building a telescope is going to be to a community? Now, isn't that the type of thing that's going to get people changing how they vote? It's a different side of the story that we can tell through social media and change the story and change the paradigm. And unfortunately, we also sometimes have to go darker places. We have to remember the other side of the human interest and cover the voices, and this is something we can do uniquely well with social media, of the local people who are sometimes being negatively impacted by our decisions. If you don't know, right now there is, debate is probably not strong enough of a word, going on in Hawaii because the construction of the 30 meter telescope was not going quite as agreed, quite as planned, and the indigenous people have decided they'd like to stop the construction. Astronomers, in some cases, very prominent individuals, have made very racist comments about how science should take priority over the willful willness, whatever, of the indigenous people. Horrible things are being said on both sides. And this is that time when you can bring up things like, in Chile, you see more and more people seeking 
education, PhDs in astronomy and becoming leaders and peers in research. But Hawaii, which is one of the leading places in the world for astronomy, in all time, there's been one indigenous Hawaiian who got a PhD in astrophysics and space science. And just leave that out there to be thought about. It again changes the story in not a good way. But we have to start these conversations. And this is sometimes where our social media is as much to our community as it is to the public. OK, new topic. It's not all bleak and awful. <laughs> you have to know your audience. You have to know how to change things up, inject humor, use the language of new media, use the language of meme, use the dialect of English that isn't acceptable for print media, that is the because reasons language of social media. And this leads to awesome opportunities when discussing things like data when we really don't have anything to discuss. How many of you have struggled? Why isn't it showing the image on my screen? OK, this is about to show, I promise you, the mosaic of four images. Of, there it is. How many of you have struggled to figure out what to do with this particular infographic, other than just say, it's Pluto. We're getting closer. We will be there in six weeks. Yeah, but beyond that, I've spent more time explaining, no, no, really, Pluto is round. It's just an unsharp mask that makes it look lumpy like Vesta. Um, it's really hard to figure out what to do when all you have is an image release. And NASA likes image releases because everyone tweets them out going, image, but no content. Emily Lakdawalla is better than anyone else out there. And if you aren't following her, you should be. She is better than anyone out there at finding ways to take these image releases and turn them into engaging her audience, getting them thinking, and getting them learning, and getting them to stay with her even though they might want to wander off and find ice cream. This occurred at like 10 p.m. Central, middle of last week. And it kept me captivated because I didn't know the answer. She tweets out this picture that had just come down from Cassini. She's constantly mining the information that has just come down off the spacecraft. And for those of you who can't read tiny words, it says, in this picture, we see only a crescent Enceladus, but we can see the night side of Mimas. Can you figure out why? She comes back a few minutes later, and she's like, I'll give you a hint in a few more minutes, and the answer in a few minutes more. And she kept me on for like 30 minutes when I wanted to go to bed, because I did not know the answer. <laughs> And the answer was, the one on the right, Mimas, was in front of Saturn and was getting Saturn shine on the other side. Whereas Enceladus was off to the side, didn't have Saturn behind it, didn't have the same amount of Saturn shine. It was a geometry problem. But I, I didn't guess that, and I'm a PhD. It was cool, and she kept me awake. Now, isn't that a cool way to engage your audience through social media? And take that stupid picture release you don't know what to do with and actually make it interesting. So can, can I just ask a question here? Yeah. I noticed it has a whole 21 retweets. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to you. How large an audience do you think it's fascinating to? It goes out to about 60,000 people. I, I understand that. Yeah. I understand that. But I, I really respect and admire Emily, too. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if she is, um, if she's, if she's, because she is so specific, if she's limiting the audience that she can reach. No. Yeah. I, it, so, so the other thing you need to remember when you look at that, seven, at that 21 retweets is the average tweet uh, has about a seven minute lifespan. And so, and this was late at night. She'd already lost all of Europe and the East Coast. 
Well, but so the, the retweets, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be argumentative, but mm -hmm. the retweets aren't instantaneous. Somebody reading it the next morning. No, could, no. you're usually it. following too many people to see this by the next morning. So now Twitter has you like, have, things you've missed. Yeah. But I think, I think the larger point is that Emily, she will talk about how she tries to be very, her tweets must be accessible. Her tweets must, everything she writes must stand on its own. Her blog posts, her tweets, they have to, because of her audience, because of how people read things and engage, they're not going to read her old blog posts. They're not going to read her other tweets for context. That this has to be independent. Yeah. And, and you look at the number of favorites, you look at the number of retweets that's part of a longer chain. And think of those numbers in terms of how many letters do you get for a given article that you have on the web. Not how many do you have in the magazine, but how many do you have on the web. And that's the number to start comparing it to. Um, this is the type of stuff that within the astronomy community, people will be going the next day. And by that, I mean like the weekly space hangout amateurs on Google+. Plus will be discussing, did you see that last night? The more high tech you get, the more the technology resents your, your master of it. Um, so, uh, let me get, uh, yeah. again, I'm here to learn. So yeah. I, and I don't mean to dominate. No, 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 that's cool. But what, you're, what I think I heard you saying is tweets are, are really an instantaneous yes. kind of uh, uh, ingestion, mm -hmm. and people really don't go back to look at old tweets. If nope. they don't see it instantaneously, they really don't care about it. Yep. I've had a different like a experience. Yeah. It, it depends. I've had people come, going back, and I think a lot of it has to do with people like images. So whenever I tweet like an historic image and say, like, here's something that you might not have noticed. There's a, you know, two gantries with Apollo 11. And, you know. Certain accounts are different. Yeah. Yours is one of them. Historic <laughs> photos is one of them. I get people favoriting and retweeting things like weeks later. Yeah. So how did you get well, so Twitter has like, weird things with its URLs. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, some kids just bugs. So, so, if you actually look at who's doing that, yeah. it's usually someone who has followed you or is about to follow you. And is going through your thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll do that. When I follow someone new, I go through all their tweets. Exactly. And then, I'll, and then I retweet them. So, so if you actually do the analytics on what the heck just happened, what you find is it's normally someone who, within an hour or so, will follow you, or who is following someone who just retweeted you. Um, and you have to really start digging into the API, which I'm a crazy enough person to do. Um, so. There are, certain, there are certain feeds that do have longevity. There are, in general though, a tweet has a seven minute lifespan. And you have to understand that and use that when you try and understand how well it went out. Um, this is why you now see people, they've learned if you're trying to promote a blog post, you need to promote it about every two hours for 24 hours. And New York Times is the place to learn when it comes to how often do you retweet things. Uh, Matthew Francis is the person to look at. Uh, Dr. Master, Dr. Mr. Francis on, because he's Dr. Mr. Francis, so it comes out as Dr. Mr. Francis on Twitter. Um, his work with Forbes, he is masterful at changing how he links to things every once in a while to find out if a turn of phrase will change it. Yeah. And so, you just blew my mind because, like, I would, my current paradigm is I would never tweet something, like, every two hours because I'm thinking to myself, oh, my followers are going to get just... No, they'll never see it. And it's entirely, you've turned it entirely yeah. on its head because I'm retweeting every two, two hours because only one nth of my followers are, are yeah. tuning in at, at any given time. Yeah. So, so you'll see people saying things like, this is where the in case you missed it hashtag comes from. Um, you'll see people saying, for the people just getting home from work, uh, for those of you on the East Coast, um, you have to re-say the things that matter over and over and over. 
because of that seven minute lifespan. Um, the other thing that you need to be careful with, both pro and con with social media, new media, is um, open access really matters. Um, and at the same time, in the sciences, there are, there is fear and trepidation about what open access will result in. So you see missions like Cassini that has an open data, pro, uh, open data policy and all of their information goes into the planetary data system. If you hate yourself enough, you can mine it back out. And a lot of journalists have figured out how to go get things before NASA has handed them out because of this open access policy. But there are a lot of scientists who are really worried about losing their message, who are really worried about having their science scooped. This came horribly to light at the Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference in March, where they were showing the first images of Ceres with those, I got the best crank yesterday. There are cranks who now believe that the shiny spots in Ceres are due to internal illumination. Aren't they? <laughs> <That'd be cool. laughs> it would be. Um, but, but at the very beginning of the session, when not everyone has got there yet, uh, it was announced that uh, people who were microblogging and otherwise using social media were not to cover what was going on in that presentation. Anyone who showed up late did not hear that. Anyone who was in a different room following along via Twitter did not hear that. And so as they were talking about the shiny spots on Ceres, the people who'd heard that message we're getting angry because we were told not to tweet this, but they're giving this in a public forum and this is sucky. Um, stronger language was used. Um, meanwhile, you have a lot of baby grad students who are happily sharing the news, who are excited, and then later get thwapped hard on the nose for releasing science that was under embargo. So open access for the press to conferences means you need to be very careful and not accidentally get in the way of PIs who will remember because PIs have very long memories. So when you take advantage of open access, when you put out those images that haven't been seen before, when you see that neat thing that looks like Bigfoot on Mars and so you meme it and bring down the wrath of the Mars community because now there's Bigfoot on Mars that they have to deal with. Understand the double edge that is open access. Now, the part of the science that almost never gets talked about because let's face it, it mostly involves people at their keyboard being angry and cursing a lot is data analysis. Um, the point where you do start to hear about data analysis is when the publications come out. So I'm gonna sort of combine these things together. Now, the first stage in talking about data analysis and publication is the conference presentation, which is, a, there we go. Um, so with the conference presentation, you see people doing their pre preliminary results. They're talking about our analysis initially shows. They're talking about we think they're engaging people in conversation trying to get that scientific dialogue going to find out what are the things they need to answer before they submit their paper to publication. And when you're at these conferences covering the science, it's really easy to walk up to a poster. There was a great one at AGU last year of folks making lava to try and understand how different mixes of minerals melt. Um, and people were just posting the pictures of the lava because it was cool. And it came back out recently and you all probably heard about the grad students grilling over their lava. Um, but what ended up happening was the discussion was, whoa, there's grad students making lava. No science. Wow, they're grilling over lava. No science. This is where you can discuss, hey, did you know different things melt at different temperatures? 
which means that you need to make lava that's more Mars-like than Earth-like if you want to get your sirloin perfectly cooked. You can take the catchphrase, you can take the turn of phrase, you can meme the thing and make it engaging and get the science out there. So when you're covering the conference poster on beer, talk about organics. And you're an LPSC person, you've seen the generations of beer posters. Um, so find the way to promote this in that catchy turn of phrase that gets the science out. And when the journals finally come out, don't forget as you're telling the, and the results are in story, to bring in the, hey, do you remember? With social media, we suddenly have the ability to essentially go back in time and remind people, hey, we talked about this being built. Hey, we talked about the people being engaged. Hey, we all went through the funding crisis and seen your review of this together. Bring that whole story together so that people can see that science isn't just something that happens overnight. Use your ability to link, use your ability to use the Wayback Engine to tell the entirety of the story as the final results come out. <clears throat> yeah? One of the interesting um, conundrums that we face at Sky and Telescope mm -hmm. is that we'll go to meetings and we'll find these preliminary results yeah. and we'll report them and we'll do a, you know, a blog about them. You and covered then, my results as a grad student that way. And then, and then two months later, the paper will come out in science, press releases will be issued, all the mass media will cover this story, and we're literally forced to cover it again and say, hey, we did this two months ago, but no one noticed. And that can go both ways. Um, there have been a few cases where, again, the open access ire of the PI has been invoked, where someone covers the poster and it does go big, it does go viral. But the problem is most media, there, there's the print media, old media, Forbes, Sky and Tell, wherever, um, that are only going to cover it once the press release is out. But this is where I remind you, we have 92,417 followers as of yesterday on Twitter, which is order of magnitude of a major astronomy journal. Which means that when a big result goes viral, so that we're talking about it on the weekly space hangout with Morgan, but it's only within the social media community. We can have as many eyes on that story, and then it'll come back up, and we get to mock those people while referring to our blog posts from the past. The problem is you have to be part of the greater dialogue on social media where it's the social media community that engages their same number large audience and be that story that all the rest of us retweet. I retweet a lot of people that I engage in dialogue with and that's one of the things where a lot of the mass media through their social media presence struggle because it's not in your best interests to retweet something that Phil writes on Slate. But when you have people like Matthew Francis who writes for Forbes, Joanne, you write for Forbes too, don't you? No. no okay. It's. So I, many yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So they do take the time to say, and, and Alan Boyle is a great example of this as well. Um, to do the, I'm going to be part of this community and raise up everybody's stories. And when you're part of the group that's able to do that because your company gives you the freedom, it allows that early story you had to suddenly, because more people will follow you if you're part of the retweet circle. Um, people like people who share. Um, <sighs> It gives you the better chance to be part of the community to raise it up through social media and allow that early story to get all the coverage. But you have to be part of that community that is recipro reciprocally sharing everything. And I don't know if your editorial policy allows that. Well, the, more to the point, that's all lovely and altruistic, mm -hmm. but there's no business model behind that. There is in terms of click-throughs. 
So it's it's like Alan knows that if he he has promoted a ton of my stuff, and he knows in turn that when I have five tweets come through my feed on a story, I'm more likely to retweet his, which means he's now getting more click-throughs, which means his advertisers are now seeing more pages, which means your cost per thousand is getting paid more times. It does have a business model, and it's in that how it increases your audience size and increases your click-throughs. But it takes a long time to garner that. And a different demographic. Your yeah. demographic is different than you know the NBC News, very American-centric demographic that Alice but but so the reach of the article. Yeah, and and I also see Alan. That's my next slide. Okay, it's it has lost its mind. My presentation has a <laughs> desire of its own. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's you do have to be part of the community, and again, you have to speak the language. So, so one thing I'd like to take a, a side trip into is lately um, a lot of us have had to start thinking about how we discuss all the things that are going on when you start to take into consideration things like it's now come out that Feynman and everyone wants to reference Feynman and everyone wants to point to the meme of Feynman. But when you find out that he was forcing his grad students' spouses and significant others into sexual acts and he was preying on undergrads, do you really want to be raising him up as the person you refer to students to to read? No. And I, I don't think any of us have been able to be completely blinders up to the number of Nobel laureates and others who have said sexist, racist, hateful, yeah. And, and this is where I want to say, be aware of your surroundings. And realize that you have the power through your words to raise things up and tear them down and be part of the status quo. And to quote uh, Dr. Horrible, the, quo is not, the status quo is not quo. Um, you have the ability, and a lot of mainstream media did jump on this to be aware of how so many people are reacting to the hate by turning it into celebration. We had the distractingly sexy meme where Tim Hunt came out, Nobel laureate, as one does, and said that he didn't think women should be in the lab because they were distractingly sexy and cried. <laughs> and he fell in love with them. Right, right. So you have Stephanie Evans over here saying, um, I, I don't know how any men were able to function when I was in this bunny suit integrating a satellite. So suddenly you're showing this is what it looks like to build a satellite. This is a woman building a satellite. You're changing the paradigm. You're covering the story of hate and making it a celebration of overcoming the hate. We had the uh, column in Science Magazine where a senior female scientist responded to a postdoc that she should just put up with her advisor looking down her shirt. And so you have Karen James responding on uh, the Ask Alice hashtag with my eyes are up here. Even a blue-footed booby offers better advice than science careers. <laughs> So you can engage in the dialogue with, we need to say no, but let's say no while laughing, because it hurts so much, the only other thing you can do is cry. And I know people who did. Um, you had the NPR story where a senior scientist said that astronomy is nothing but boys with toys. And a lot of us were a little bit mad about that one. So you have girls with toys, a woman from the Rover program. Find ways to be aware of your surroundings, to participate, to celebrate, and to get in on retweeting these things, promoting these efforts, and using your voice to change how people see science. Now, another part of changing your surroundings, which I'm kind of grateful I didn't screen capture in, in real time, um, and Jason Majors, who I love 
dearly as a communicator, is guilty of this more than anyone because I think he uses timed tweets. Um, there are lots of times when our world kind of falls apart and you need to make sure you're not promoting your story while everyone's social media is discussing the rocket that blew up, the earthquake that collapsed major cities. Um, one of the things I saw recently that was just like, no, was in the midst of the coverage of the um, secondary earthquake that has a scientific term that has escaped my brain. Aftershock. I'm an astronomer. Um, in, in the midst of discussing the aftershock of the Nepalese earthquake and the devastation in Kathmandu and Everest and so many other cities, my Twitter feed is donate, Red Cross, earthquakes, Himalayas, lots of good coverage and then random article on do we need to worry about fracking causing earthquakes read more link 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 and it was like suddenly happy earthquake it just didn't quite know bad timing save that one for later the middle of rocket explosions is not the time to promote your story on SpaceX being the bright big future of tomorrow with a happy post um, and sometimes you have to do what John Stewart did the other day. And it goes to the next slide when my screensaver comes on. Um, he actually did an episode where at the beginning of the episode, um, because it, the big news item of the day was the shooting of nine people in a South Carolina church by a shooter who sat with them in prayer for an hour before he killed them. And how do you turn that into a Comedy Central story? And so he just went on air and he said, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. I have Malala as a guest tonight, and we're going to spend tonight talking about the education of girls. There is going to be no humor. And sometimes you have to go dark, and you have to raise up awareness of what's going on in the world around you. Because to do anything else is to lose followers and to break your connection to the community. We have the ability in how we communicate to change the world that is so filled with biases and so filled with hate by raising up new voices. And right now is a real turning point where people are starting to become aware because apparently Nobel laureates are starting to become more brash that there are a lot of powerful people in sciences with massive influence who are assholes. And we have the ability to, just as when we write stories about Warner von Braun and we footnote it with, and he came from Nazi Germany, to say, and Feynman was a sexual predator, and Tim Hunt was a sexist, and James Webb was anti-LBG, LGBTQ, and got people fired we have the ability to then point to the younger voices, to point to the Sarah Horsts who are talking about the Europa and their missions, to point to all of the young scientists who are women and the far too few people who are people of color. One of the problems we have is a lot of people in the public are like, how do you have a problem with minorities? The most famous astronomer is this black dude from New York City. How do you say you have a problem with ableism when the most famous physicist in the world has a wheelchair that he rolls you over with if you ask a dumb question? Which is actually true. We have the ability to, when we're at a conference, choose to take pictures that include the real diversity that is there. There is a very photogenic um, geologist who has a fabulous seeing eye dog who's at LPSC. There are many people with wheelchairs if we take the time to find them. There is more than one articulate black man in astronomy. There's Derek Pitts, there's Gabor whose last name I can't pronounce who's here at UC Berkeley. Thank you. <laughs> um, when you need the go-to person, don't go to the go-to person everyone already knows. Diversify the voices. Raise up new people and change the face of who you're covering and link to them 
and get people following them because they probably have social media too. So you can actually be the change you want to see in the world. Just a few retweets at a time. Um, tell the story. Don't just tell the facts. That's easy. Do the hard part and bring the humanity back into the sciences. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, and this may be an unpopular question, but I'm curious at what point you think that in tweeting we go too far, though. We become so concerned about an issue, and, and I'll give you my example. On the day that the that Rosetta and Phil the shirt, made, yeah, the shirt gate. Made, like everybody attacked Matt Taylor for wearing a shirt. So instead of saying, "Wow, this is the most amazing thing," he's just devoted all this time to it, and he's had this great. Let me turn that around. Because I had people threaten to end my career because I retweeted sarcastic Rover's comment of. Philae didn't deploy all of its harpoons because it was saving one for the shirt. <laughs> I retweeted that and I had people say I had committed a hate crime, go to my university to try and get me fired under codes of conduct. They failed. Uh -huh. um, there was several tens of thousands of dollars raised for him to go on a vacation. Almost all of the women who engaged in that dialogue had trolling death threats, rape threats. That broadcast went out live to most of the schools in Europe. We had spent, because I work with ESA as well, we had spent a year promoting that, doing lead up events, testing our technology. Most of the tweets were not shaming him, were not abusing him, were pissed off that no one at ESA had the time to say, shit, dude, different shirt. And I, I'm in total agreement with and that, but at some point, like, you the biggest day of his life. He ruined the biggest day of his life by putting on that shirt. So you're in a situation where the everyday sexism, which is completely acceptable to the point that it is okay at my university for tenured faculty to say, I will not have tenure because I have tits, in front of the baby faculty. That kind of everyday sexism allows all the higher up levels. How do we stop this? I agree. I, I guess I'm just curious at what point, you know, social media can do a lot of good and it can also do a lot of evil. People are willing to say things very quickly on social media that they wouldn't say in real life. And, and I think things like Shirtgate tend to get really out of hand really quickly. Even people, you know, threatening lives and... So, so the problem that we're running into is the myth... myth, myth about what's happening. With Tim Hunt, this is a brilliant example. People are saying that people were calling for him to resign, that they were calling for him to quit. The reality is we were calling for him to like not say asshole things. And so you have people like Brian Cox, like Richard Dawkins coming out and saying, all of these women called for his resignation, they ruined his career. It was a lynch mob. Yeah. And not one tweet has been identified that called for any of those things. Mm -hmm. So the problem that we have is one of messaging, where you have the old guard, Richard Dawkins qualifies, coming down and saying that all of these people who are trying to say this form of sexism is wrong are a lynch mob, are ruining careers, are demanding careers get ended, and then they're demanding our careers get ended. And so what you're inadvertently saying is those of us who are actually having our careers threatened need to be careful when we call for an end to misogyny. And what I would challenge you to do is write the stories that profile the truths of people saying this is a lynch mob, this is horrific, when what we're actually saying is why did no one at ESA say, Polo, we sell these in the shop, go right. put this and on? You wouldn't to say that. Absolutely. And most of us said that. But I don't know that you want to ruin the biggest day of his life. He ruined. Because he made a bad Look, choice. We might have distracted 
from a huge ESA event that yes. took out you know years of planning yeah. and all of that. But it brought attention to an even more important uh, issue that's going to affect not just this year or next year or last year, but so, many, many years to come. Yeah, but, and we ended up doing more good than, no. than we ended up doing. No, you have to do it in the moment. I'm sorry. There were Children. thousands of schools in Europe that day where all the kids signed in and what the girls learned was they are pinup dolls. And they went home and their parents could say, no, I'm aware of what happened, let's talk about this. Whereas if no one had raised the conversation because we were celebrating Rosetta, those little girls would have continued to know, I'm just a pinup doll. I think also another thing to point out there is that there were so many opportunities for him not to put on that shirt. And there were opportunities for other managers, his coworkers, to say, that shirt is not OK. And it really demonstrates a systematic failure of ESA culture, of his. And he comes out of NASA culture as well. And, you know, he's worked in a lot of places. And the fact that that sort of behavior goes unchecked and he thinks it's OK, the pattern of the fabric was called space slut. It was made by a woman. You know, that would be a great shirt for him to wear to a party on his own, celebrating it, where it's not going to be on camera for thousands of children and for women who've also worked hard for their entire careers to have one sexist comment in their career, to have one sexist incident ruin their career. I think the response was proportional, and I think it didn't ruin his life. He, he still has his job. Apology. Yeah. He still has his job. He cried on live TV with his apology. People I know still follow him on Twitter. People have really engaged with him. And I don't think it was at all inappropriate or bad. And I don't think it ruined the hard work. There were hundreds of us crammed into a room at DPS in November watching this landing and cheering. And you know, we will never forget that. And, and all of us, I think, also, when he donated all of the money, that the men's right activists gave him to go on vacation to European educational programs. All of us celebrated that. Uh -huh. And it is in the proportional celebrating of someone turning around to the why didn't the system stop this. Uh -huh. Mistakes get made. And yeah. Once they get made, all you can do, and he made a mistake, and the managers above him made a mistake, and his best friend who he sat down next to that day made a mistake. Yeah. The best thing you can do once it's happened is make something good out of it. And if it brought up the issue to you know a much wider audience than even the 90,000 people that we could have reached in this room, then yeah. ultimately we did the best that we could with a mistake. And it's no different than the mistake that happened when uh, the rover bounced or the lander bounced and bounced again. We were able to make good on what wasn't you know how we wanted things to go. And, that's just what you can do. And, and you really have to think about the people who are there in the moment who, if you wait to say something, will think that what was said was right. Yes. I want to give another example of kind of positive things coming mm -hmm. out of these really tense, negative yeah. things. And that's um, back to the Mauna Kea and TNT. So there was a post by a UC, uh, UC um, Santa Cruz professor that was inappropriate towards these protesters, um, used the word hordes of Native Americans. And yeah. This is Sandy Farber. She's like, a, yeah. This is a very important. She's, a she's one of, of the people. reasons Hubble exists. Uh, yeah. A horde of Native Hawaiians were lying. Right. About, so, so, so this went out, and then um, a UC Berkeley professor, Alex Villapingo, uh, tweet, sent that out to tons of followers. It went viral. Um, out of that, so a lot of horrible things have come about from that. Um, but the good things that have come about that probably not very many people know about is that then Alex Filipenko um, spent hours thinking about that and writing an apology yeah. and sending that out. At the same time here at Berkeley, some of the Native um, uh, American students here were really upset about it, brought it to Gabor Bowsery, who's our Vice Chancellor for Equity and yeah. Inclusion. Uh, I also saw these tweets, sent him an email right away, because our group is um, actively involved in this kind of work. Yeah. And, um, and he 
a convened with our multicultural science uh, with our multicultural group at campus. They they basically help undergrads who are basically not white. Um, they help these undergrads really succeed at Berkeley. So it's kind of a home for them. Um, Berkeley's not a very good home. Um, they did this whole it like makes the elephant in the room. You can finally talk about it. And and you and it is painful and it you know kind of makes it makes me shake you know shake yeah <laughs> you can hear the emotion that comes out but that has to happen before the positive things can happen and so I think you know here at Berkeley there's a lot of things that need to be fixed and that social media event actually triggered physical face to face meeting that would have never happened yeah. had that social media event not happened. So it's, it's fascinating, actually, how this all works. And, and it's changing the awareness, because it, a, a senior white male who I dearly respect, and I have known since I was a baby grad student and have gotten lots of career advice from over the years, um, in response to, I don't remember which one of the recent Nobel Prize winners being assholes this occurred with, but he he we were having a different conversation and he commented on it's just also un unbelievable and i was in a position to respond no actually this is completely normal he just did it out loud with journalists and and so suddenly all the things that so many of us have experienced over and over and over we can have the dialogue we can remove the shame we can change the word unbelievable to unacceptable mm -hmm. and add the footnote of yeah he's a great scientist but a lot of the things he did are unacceptable mm -hmm. and we can activate change alec filipinko is like the sweetest human and he had a moment of being angry that the telescope he needed wasn't going to go as planned and he forwarded somebody else's words. All of us have made that mistake occasionally. And now he's going to forever be more careful. And it was because in the moment, it was like, dude, wrong. You have to slap the kid's wrist. Well, and that gets to the root of my question, I guess, is that we're so quick to you know, things like this happen, and, and as a news source, you're trying to, or a new media source, you're trying to keep up with it, and you want to be in the conversation, but you're not really sure that you should always jump in there, and, and I guess, yeah, that's the root of the problem. At what point do you feel like you should jump into the, the conversation? With the footnote of, just like you would footnote Warner Von Braun, you footnote these guys. You celebrate their science and you don't celebrate their humanity. And you call for change just like you footnote Warner von Braun. And I have never invoked Nazis before and never thought it would actually be rational, but it fits here. <laughs> I just lost the internet. Thank you. I was just going to yeah. say, several questions back. When we were talking about Shergate, yeah. it, it's an interesting thing to me to look at, you know, the results of that versus the results of Tim Hunt, right? Mm -hmm. Where he took something where he screwed up and made it a good thing versus curse all you evil social media people, which is, you know, It's a difference in age. But, uh, yeah, but I'm just saying, I mean, in, in terms of situation, right, it, it doesn't have to be the worst thing in the world, you know? It, it should be done. I think that's been, that's been made in. But, you know, if you respond by being an asshole, then, you know, versus, oh, wow, I really screwed up. It and really says more about you than the original action. You know. And what fascinates me about all these stories is all of them have a way to turn it into raising up the community. With the Ask Alice careers column of look, let him look down your shirt, um, it got turned into a hashtag of we, women memeing it in ways to make it clear not cool while invoking the laughter. 
with Tim Hunt's comments, it became the distractingly sexy. With the dude on NPR, I'm sorry, he has a really long name. I know better than to say things out loud because um, I will mispronounce the dude's long name. Um, when he made his boys with toys comment, it became a girls with toys. All of these stories, Shirtgate became a donation for education. All of these things have the positive story that you can start with. And most of your readers are only gonna read the first two paragraphs. But for those who care, give the rest of the story and work to change society. It will make you better and different. If you look at the coverage of the South Carolina sh shooting, it was actually Geraldo who, her Geraldo Rivera. Yes, yes. I type more than I talk. Um, he was the. I need many things. Um, he was actually the first person to use the word terrorism, domestic terrorism, in relationship to the shooting. And he got praised for that change of language. When you do things to acknowledge the hate in the world and to change the story and to call for help and to call for us to be a better people, you often get praised up by the people who are larger in number who have suffered. Um, it can help your audience by you being a good person. And would you rather grow your audience <coughs> by calling for things to be better and getting followed by all those masses who, like you, want to improve the world? Or would you rather increase your following one pretty picture with no content at a time? They will both work. I would say that the one is more meaningful than the other. I'm sorry, that got really serious. I can pull observatory cats back up. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got a lot. <laughs> it was your Tumblr I went to, I think. Oh, I have an update that. Oh, yeah, I know, but that's OK. I think another thing to point out is when there's something just atrocious that goes on, and, and not just about earthquakes, but like incidences of racism or other things, like the, um, the shooting in South Carolina, don't tweet. Just no, don't go tweet. dark. Just go dark. Just read. Just read. Just read. Yeah. There's a lot of things that will go by you on Twitter and Facebook that might make you uncomfortable. And a lot of people, their immediate reaction is, oh, let's just go back to business as usual. What, one of the things I did, can, yeah. Just as a follow-up question, because I'm really like, new to Twitter. Like, I was at AppSecon, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, would you stop tweeting conferences? No. But you, you, but so you put out the acknowledgment. that says, you know, gosh, this thing has happened, like, yeah. as a person who's not necessarily affected by this, it is a huge privilege for me to just go back to yeah. yeah. Business as usual, and tweet the mundane. Yeah, because I wasn't sure like no. the best way to you, that. No. So, so two specific examples on that. Um, our big 36-hour hangout-a-thon, science, 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 fundraise, and fundraise, beg, 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 that we do every year for CosmoQuest, um, was the same weekend that the Nepalese earthquake occurred. And many times throughout the Hangout-a-thon, I said, tune into what's happening in Nepal. I feel like an ass begging for money. Give to the places that matter. Donate blood, support those people. We need your money too, but I feel like an ass. Um, so you need to acknowledge. Um, and it may seem counterintuitive to go dark. Um, Thursday in the morning, I got up and I saw what had happened in South Carolina. And we have Michael Brown's sister on our campus. We have talked so much about race, talked so much about what's going on. And it, it was one of these I hate our planet moments. And so I basically tweeted, I'm going dark today. I had one rogue comment, one rogue blog tweet that went out that I f feel bad about. Um, but other than that, I spent the entire day retweeting people from, there's actually a black Twitter and a white Twitter if you're not aware of it. There are almost two entirely non-overlapping groups of humanity. Take the time to invest in finding the top people in black Twitter and following them. It will change your perspective on the United States. 
Um, I spent my entire day retweeting people from black Twitter. Other than news agencies, I only posted retweets of people of color that day. And I gained more followers that day than I had in a really long time. Because people want you to be better. And they respond to that. So it's not going to hurt you to go dark and raise up others. And, and if you do acquire jerks that way who comment at you, you're going to lose two followers and they're jerks anyway. And you right. don't want to be interacting with them. Yeah. And, and as majority white privileged people, we, it is our, I think it's our obligation to put other voices up there that wouldn't necessarily be heard by our audiences. And people like learning things. Twitter is easy, Twitter is comfortable. Yeah. They're following you because they want to learn something. Go ahead. Do you think when you tweet, should your Twitter presence be primarily personal or professional? You split them or you I split them. So, so one of the unfortunate you... things that we learned through our research, I, I, as Graf showed, do research on this stuff, not as much as I'd like because I don't have a grant for it, which means spare time research. Um, if you actually track over time how communities that have single humans that are deeply related to them have their social media following grow. So you can look at Carolyn Porco with Cassini, you can look at Alan Stern with New Horizons, you can look at um, me with CosmoQuest. There's a bunch of these different examples out there um, where you have single individual who inadvertently becomes a primary face because they're the poor schmo that gets all the invited talks. Um, and then you also have the professional Twitter. So you can look at Cassini, which I think may once again, but it's always gone back and forth, have more followers than Carolyn. Um, People would prefer to follow the human than to follow the mission. Right, so my question is, as a human, do you, how do you divvy up your tweets versus personal versus professional? For example, all this about you know, women in science, Black Lives Matter, all those issues are obviously very important. But they're also very personal. But then if your job is to also promote science or do, do whatever, how do you kind of balance that? And how do you... How does that motivate your tweeting strategy? You have to balance it the same way you balance the hours in the day. Um, people want to connect to you as a human being, which is why they actually care about that airplane delay, which has always confused me. But people enjoy those tweets where you are deriding American Airlines. Um, just as the hours in your day get split between the conversations in the hallway about non-work and the conversations about work, you have to split your social media presence. People want to see you as a human being. And this means you tell the story of my friend, this person I respect, my role model, when you're forwarding others. You, I'm excited about, hey, have you thought about, you treat social media the way you treat the water cooler. And just as at the water cooler, you're going to discuss the state spending cut, the uh, cost of a Soviet launch vehicle, you talk about those things on social media. And just like you go back to your keyboard and write all those e emails and all those reports that are work-related, you write all the tweets that are work-related. So. On a given day, if I'm writing a grant, I'm going to have all of my tweets that day be related to writing the grant or what I saw on Twitter in the 30 seconds I wasn't writing the grant. If I'm at a conference, 90% of my tweets are going to be about the conference and other things that go by in my Twitter feed will be about 10% of it. On a weekend, it's going to go more and more towards Catter Day. Um, find a role model. Um, People that, that I think can really help in trying to shape your voice. Um, Will Wheaton is very good about how to be a human on the internet. Amanda Palmer is very good about the art of asking and engaging people to form a community. Um, within our field, 
Um, Katie Mack, Astro Katie, is phenomenal in terms of getting a lot of the science out there. Her communications actually led, she's a theorist who works in neutrinos. She had the owner of a gold mine approach her and ask if she would like to build an instrument in his gold mine, and that is now occurring. Um, there is Planet Doctor, there's Andy Rifkin. Um, there are parody accounts like Sarcastic Rover. Um, he actually gets a lot of science out. Yeah, and he's not a scientist. No. Um, I mean, he's hilarious. So find the people who are doing it right that you resonate with, that you're most likely to want to share what they're saying, and let them be your role model. And so just like you figure out how you want to be a scientist by looking around and going, I don't want to live that life. I wouldn't live that life. Find the role models. Different people are going to have different voices. This is why we have different audiences, and that's OK. Can I sharpen that question just a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, to ask specifically about politics, mm -hmm. because there's you know, a wealth of research out there that shows that people tend to write off almost instantaneously the opinion of people who have broadly different political views. In yeah. Um, and unlike, you know, the people that you are going to lose by, you know, speaking out against Tim Hutt, Hunt, whatever, these aren't assholes. They're just people who have often legitimately different yeah. opinions than us. But if we're mixing our personal and our professional views, are we hurting the, the impact that we could have? Because we're, maybe by 50%, filtering out the people who are going to listen to us. And I mean, how do we balance that with the need that, in some cases, those are the, the people that aren't going to pay attention to us are the ones we really need to meet. This is, uh, how this, do, is, how do you deal with that? this is where we have to be careful in how we say it. So just like I wouldn't advocate for tweeting, and Congress cut X billion dollars from the NASA budget today, because that's just okay, what does that mean? If you, when you're discussing the political stories, instead of saying the G GOP did this, the Democrats did that, say so-and-so, not GOP, not the generic label that isn't as all-encompassing as they'd like it to be, did this thing which actually means this or actually contradicts this science with a link to a blog post with this thing will have this, you have to tie it to something so that it's not a personal attack, it's something that will cause them to change their paradigm. One of the big things that comes out of sociology and education research is teaching facts and figures never changes opinion. If someone has a misconception, a um, they believe in astrology, they believe if they have a belief that cannot be backed up with science. You cannot talk to them about data and change what they think. If you instead tell the story that breaks their paradigm, if you instead show them the video of a demonstration that breaks their paradigm, it is only by breaking the cognitive connections that they have perhaps built between very disparate and false things. It is by breaking those connections that you can change. So when we're dealing with politics, what we have to do is find ways to communicate things that it isn't a name calling, it isn't just the contextualist facts and figures, but it is instead, we just canceled, as happened at one point, GLAST. It's now happily launched and called Fermi. Uh, we canceled GLAST. This means this many people are going to get fired, this amount of science can't be done, this amount of money that has already been spent is just getting thrown out the window. It's not a, the Republicans are anti-science and they need to give us back our spacecraft. It's a, we're actually firing all of these people. People fight to save factories. Why don't they fight to save spacecraft the same way? Change the story to break the paradigm, to get people to rethink things outside of the GOP versus Democratic context. It's harder. This is why so many people on Twitter have blogs. This is why Facebook is there. This is why Google Plus is there. If you want to engage in the longer conversations, you have to use your social media to point to something that allows the deeper conversation. YouTube, 
Vine is awesome. I don't have time because life. Um, Twitter is my favorite because my brain works in that. But you need to find ways to have the longer conversations. Maybe that goes back to your point about um, you know the more we kind of point to one another's yeah. resources and um, writings, the better. Because Twitter, you know, it really, in many ways, it really is a way to point to other resources. Yeah. And so I get some. I find some of the best. Um, Articles through people tweeting, of, you know, so they have a, a very innovative tweet, but then there's a link to a long article about that topic. So right, and through bot blogs or you know some of your journals or, or articles. So uh, yeah, I think this you know social just having things really connected is is impactful. Yeah, and there's Storify. Um, if you don't know, there's a it's Storify.com and it allows you to collect tweets from a person or a hashtag, and you can bring in individual things from other social media. Um, and it collects everything to grow together. And you can share that collection, and this is a way to capture the online dialogues that go on. Um, this is very powerful um, in cases of someone live covering a conference, live covering a talk. This is very powerful during ongoing events. Um, it does take all of us to tell all sides of the community, all sides of the story to all sides of the community. But we can capture all of that. And also, if I'm covering something and Joanne retweets it, and you have the largest follower in the room on Twitter, um, suddenly our overlapping audiences her people are likely to follow me. Um, if I then retweet Sandy, now people that started out following Joanne are now potentially following Sandy. And when Sandy retweets Amy, it's, it's this continuing, you're digging deeper and deeper. And it's never going to be a screaming out to the exact same choir. We all have different choirs we preach to. Um, but we can get people to sometimes visit other churches. Yeah. How much time a day do you spend on Twitter, either tweeting or reading other people's tweets? Probably. So if it's a day where the world is collapsing and my brain is like, oh my god, I can't believe they shot someone. Um, those are days where I'm like spiky all over the place, can't concentrate, pissed off at the planet. And I'll probably spend a couple of hours, and that's bad for productivity. Um, on days where I am not personally pissed off about my inability to fix society, um, it's true. I have I get pissed off about irrational things. Um, on a more normal day, I will spend maybe five minutes every half hour just checking out the randomness. Um, that's going on as a, I need to stop because I'm starting to write incoherently and I have written the same paragraph in four different ways and that's not useful for a 15 page limit. Um, it's how I turn my brain off. It's, it's the pause, get a soda, check Twitter while walking down the stairs. Um, I have a tendency to be oblivious of the real world and walk into things because I'm checking Twitter. I have no shame. Um, so one to two hours a day. Uh, ten, I'm trying to cut through what was a... So 10 minutes, 16 hours a day. So 10 times 16 is 160. So yeah, that's about two and a half hours a day. But it's also... I communicate with my friends that way. So how many hours a day do you spend talking to your spouse, talking to your friends, talking to other humans? For me, all of that communications, including with my husband who works on the other side of the exact same stupid house, all of that's going on through social media. So I am an aberrant. I admit that. This is part a, of what- A lovable aberrant. Thank you. Um, <coughs> but so I had a postdoc who got an awesome job and will have tenure in six years if all goes well. Um, so she's no longer my postdoc. She's now an awesome human, tenure track somewhere else. 
um, when she was my postdoc doing social media for CosmoQuest as part of her duties, she was expected to post about five to ten things a day and correspond with all of our folks. And what I told her to do was we all in this room probably get Rick Feinberg's happy press releases of joy in science. Um, and if it was relevant, she was to tweet about it and either write a blog post or link to somebody else's blog post. So figure once per press release, three minutes on Twitter. Um, and then probably five times a day, five minutes, just throwing something out there and checking on everyone that was going on. So professionally, we're looking at however many press releases there were. That's part of our job to read them anyways. Um, and then another probably 25 minutes a day. So as a science communicator, that makes sense. And it pays off. Sometimes in really weird ways. My weirdest moment as a social media person was I got up at 5 a.m. in Australia to go take pictures, and it wasn't pretty. I was in like my Nike fleece pants and ugly t-shirt and hair and ponytail and jet lagged, and I got recognized in Australia because Google Plus. So um, we can impact the world, and I now wear makeup in airports because people. <laughs> so. I don't know if you guys get paid by the click or have like get page view stuff or have ads on Sky and Telescope. Yeah. But Twitter is a good way to get clicks. Oh and, and, and we do. And you know there's a Sky and Telescope Twitter account. This it's like I'm trying to find Marcus's point was was yeah. kind of yeah. I'm trying to find where I'm going to find the time in my already overcommitted day. While walking. To do, I don't yeah, <laughs> to do the things that you that you're doing that have potential value, but I need to find a way to carve out the time to to experiment. You can do it. Like I would never. Sorry, to interrupt. I would to your point. I would never tweet about a rant about American Airlines if my flight was delayed. I'm sorry. I've got better things to do with my time. It has actually caused American Airlines to rescue I me. Don't <laughs> I really don't yeah. care. Yeah. Right? I'm, I, I do want to humanize my Twitter mm -hmm. persona. Yeah. In a way that is still conveying useful information in an altruistic way about science. And I, I but I would, like, I unfollow, I used to follow, you know, Miles O'Brien. Yeah. But I unfollowed him because I didn't care what he had for breakfast. And, and yeah, I wouldn't do that. And it's not that I would rant about American Airlines. It's that I would say something like, it looks like there's going to be another cardio workout as I race through ORD trying to get to EPSC. And, and so it's the, this is a day in the life of a scientist. And you tag it, nomadic astronomer, um, knowing knowing the hashtags that are out there. Um, and it doesn't have to be the level to which I do it. Um, you can do, so two tweets a day doesn't work. You need to have at least 10 a day is what they're now recommending. Some of them can be repeats. Um, to give you a specific, amp a specific example of something that worked remarkably well and was a throwaway moment in time, um, is yesterday when they were talking about atmospheres, I threw out a throwaway tweet of, hey, remember that post on whether or not Mars was warm and wet uh, or more likely cold or however I phrased it. Maven's working to try and atmospherically work back to what was going on. And I linked to a blog post that I'd referred to. And I got a couple hundred extra views for a post that went out a couple weeks ago or a week ago at this point. And that was a throwaway, not repeated, random, being contextual, referring to something that had happened. Um, I'm sorry, there isn't a golden pill. It's not easy. No, look, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not fun. Don't do it. Yeah. I don't do Pinterest. 
I like Pinterest. People keep telling me I should Pinterest, that it would be better for my career. And I ended up going, I, I go to Pinterest and suddenly I'm like lost looking at costumes for four hours. And I, I do not allow myself on Pinterest because I apparently like myself enough to try and write grants instead of costume. Um, so, like, I, like, I think Kelly's going to say like, we, it's not my personality to tweet. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I'm an introvert. I don't like say everything that's on my mind. It's and not so, mine either. And but I, I feel like social media still is get of, some good, I'm not going to get as much right. out of it as Sandy or Pamela or somebody, but I still get good things out of it. Um, and right, so, so a little like, is better than none, and a lot is better than a little. And so as a person, like, I, don't, like, I don't get paid to tweet. Like, this is, yeah. as a freelance writer, I get paid to write articles. And like part of my the reason for Twitter is just it's frankly it's just business. It's kind of like just to, so editors know who you are. And yeah. But then like if it's um, I'm trying to wonder like yeah why if it takes that much time and effort and work and if it's not that fun for me like is it worthwhile? Well, I, to do it or? I kind of enjoy it as a, as a smart ass. Too, because I, I found that's actually moved to it because I was making like pithy comments on Facebook and I was like, this seems more. Yeah. But but as a freelancer too, right? Where Kelly's got site directed back to uh, Sky and Telescope, right? I, I'm trying to figure out the same way. Is it? Because I will get lost. I, I I found myself very easily getting distracted. I'm like, should I be doing something that will give me a hard number check? Question: Do any of you know about Pomodoros? <laughs> is this is from the computer science community. Yes. Okay, we have one person. You were at MIT, that's sort of expected. Um, in the computer science community, out of the agile programming community, which is not a language, it's a style of programming where you work in a way that isn't a five-year plan, but you look step-by-step step in an agile way where the plan you have is designed to allow flexibility and rescoping at all times, more how a spacecraft is actually built versus how people think it is built. In the agile programming community where people have done lots and lots of work trying to figure out what is actually effective for programming. There is the American paradigm that is in most places of you sit down and you code for 20 hours straight until your product is done. And it's actually found through a lot of research that there's a lot of diminishing returns on this. One technique that has been found that is actually highly effective and you can download apps for your phone is you work for 25 minutes, five minutes off. 25 minutes, five minutes off. Three to four hours depending on your personal, how long your brain works. 30 minutes to an hour off, rinse and repeat. This style of working where during those 20 minutes you allow yourself zero interruptions and people will actually schedule all their Pomodoros through a day on what they're going to do. And then five minutes of wee! Force yourself away from the keyboard. There are OSX apps for Pomodoros that will black out your whole screen with countdowns of do not touch your keyboard. You're going to take a break. Dramatically increases work efficiency because this is an easier way for our brain to store information, to reprocess, to have that moment to go. And brains need to clean themselves out and write things out to long-term memory periodically. B-O-M-O-D-O-R-U-S? I don't think there's, it's Pomodoro singular, but yeah, like the tomato. Oh, okay. um, the way I work, because I picked this up from the Agile community, computer science, other half of my brain, um, I use that, oh crap, I have to stop writing this grant now. I shouldn't go eat something out of the refrigerator. Hey, I'm going to hang out on social media for a few minutes. And it has actually increased my productivity and increased my audience. So sometimes you simply have to look at how you are working and be more efficient while letting your brain play on social media. Um, that's my strategy stolen ruthlessly from the Agile community. It's also common in the education community as well. Okay. Chunking your time and breaks and things like that. And everyone has to find their own way. Yeah, I wonder if there's a, just in terms also of just this question of 
you know, kind of what does it buy you, the Twitter world? Um, and I, we talked about this yesterday. Yeah. Is one of the things that I found about, and I don't tweet a lot. I don't tweet as much as Pamela at all. But, and I didn't have a lot of followers. But this is helping a lot, but <laughs> this event. But, um, but what it has, what it does do is, even if you're just tweeting about your interests as, say, a freelance writer, um, and what you're writing about, and finding kind of clever ways to occasionally tweet, not even the two hours, what, what's interesting about Twitter is there's something that allows you to start finding people who have similar interests in places you would never find them yeah. otherwise. So I was telling Pamela, she was telling me about a colleague that she now has through Twitter, and I met um, a teacher who was working in Watts, California, and he was tweeting about um, teenager, his high school teens, and, sci and he was teaching them about something, so I found him, because I would do the hashtag and look for new people. And through that, then he ended up coming to Stanford and getting a, um, he's getting his PhD in science education, and is now on our advisory board, and has made all these connections for me in a, in a, in a community I would never know. So I have all these people in his sphere of influence that now pay attention to the work we're doing in our multiverse site that would, I would have never met if Twitter wasn't around. And because how would I know this person in Watts, California, yeah. who's this amazing high school teacher, without you know doing hashtags for culture, science? So I think the hashtags also could be a good you, way to kind of... Hashtagging, finding thought leaders, those, those people who are hubs of lots of other people, and in curating who you follow, you can actually save yourself time by finding the people who are paid to do social media and nothing else, who are out there curating the content that you need to be more effective, and you're just not the one out there every day finding it. Um, I've managed to curate some people on my list that I'm able to plug into the social science research world, and I don't have time to track all of that literature. But they're putting out the papers that I need to know about to be better at what I do. Um, so, see it also as a professional development tool. Um, find those people that you can learn from through what they tweet. Pamela, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.